History as it happens, February 15th, 2022. Not one inch. Any American in Ukraine should leave as soon as possible and in any event in the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, we don't know uh, what decision President Putin will make. We are not saying that a decision has been taken, a final decision has been taken by President Putin. What we are saying... We've lined up that steep have- consequences should Russia choose further aggression. I've been absolutely clear with President Putin. He has no misunderstanding. If any, any assembled Russian units move across the Ukrainian border, that is an invasion. And my message is clear. There is no alternative to diplomacy. Every day, U.S. officials warn a Russian invasion of Ukraine is imminent. Europe has not seen major bloodshed since the breakup of Yugoslavia in the 1990s, a terrible chapter in an otherwise peaceful three-quarters of a century on a continent that had been destroyed by the Second World War. The new international order formed after that war gave birth to NATO, and it's NATO's post-Cold War expansion that Russia blames for today's crisis. And each side claims history as an ally. That's next as we report History as It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. For over 40 years, the United States led the West in the struggle against communism and the threat it posed to our most precious values. I think he wants Ukraine. I think he wants more than Donbass. I think he wants more than, you know, Crimea. I think he wants more than a swath of territory from Donbass to uh, Odessa. I, I think he wants Ukraine. History never moves in a straight line. Decisions made, say, 30 years ago did not produce inevitable outcomes. They should not have imprisoned successive generations of U.S. leaders. But recent history might serve as a guide to understanding how Eastern Europe was brought to the brink of war between two nations that share a complicated past, Russia and Ukraine. On Christmas Day 1991, the day the Soviet Union disappeared, President Bush gave a triumphalist televised address in which he made clear the future of the former Soviet republics, Ukraine included, would face West. This is a day of great hope for all Americans. Our enemies have become our partners, committed to building democratic and civil societies. They ask for our support and we will give it to them. Two years before that, prior to making his first presidential trip to Europe to solidify the NATO alliance as the Cold War wound down, Bush also made clear NATO would be part of Europe's future. We are ready to work with the United Europe to extend the peace and prosperity we enjoy to other parts of the world. And we hope to move beyond containment to integrate the Soviet Union into the community of nations. And it was during these momentous years when Secretary of State James Baker is said to have promised the Soviets that NATO would not move one more inch toward its borders. Once a unified Germany was brought into NATO, the historian Mary Surratt documents these negotiations in her book titled Not One Inch, America, Russia and the Making of Post-Cold War Stalemate. Now, Russian President Vladimir Putin used those very words, not one inch, in his annual press conference in December 2021 to remind everyone of that supposedly broken promise. And he was asked by a Western journalist to explain his stance toward Ukraine's potential membership in NATO. Putin's answer is through an interpreter. You have said, talked a lot about security guarantees, and now we've seen your proposals. You also say you have no intention of invading Ukraine. So will you guarantee unconditionally that you will not invade Ukraine or any other sovereign country? Or does that depend on how negotiations go? And another question. What is it do you think that the West does not understand about Russia or about your intentions? Thank you. Speaking of the security guarantees and what it will depend upon, or if something will depend upon the negotiations, our actions will not depend on the negotiation. They will depend on the unconditional compliance with the Russian security demands today and in the historical context. In this sense, we have made it clear that any further NATO movement to the east is unacceptable. There is nothing unclear about this. We are not deploying our missiles over at the borders of the U.S. No. On the other hand, the U.S. is deploying its missiles close to our home, on the, on the porch of our house. What would the Americans think if we, for example, 
decided to come to the border between, say, Canada and the United States or Mexico and simply deploy our missiles over there. Now, that was just a few months ago. In 1997, Mikhail Gorbachev, who helped sweep the USSR into the dustbin of history, visited Congress where he warned U.S. lawmakers that expanding NATO would cause conflict with Russia, then ruled by Boris Yeltsin. I believe it's a mistake. It's a bad mistake. And I'm not persuaded by the assurances that we hear that Russia has nothing to worry about. Now, none of this means it's okay for Vladimir Putin to turn back the clock to a bygone era when strongmen rulers used force or the threat of force to revise international boundaries. It does mean generations of U.S. leaders ignored the probability Russia would react badly to NATO encroachment. Terrible wars have started over such disputes, as recent European history proves. So let's have a three-way conversation, a debate even, with Anatole Levin, a senior research fellow on Russia and Europe at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Anatole and I discussed Russian-Ukrainian history recently. That episode is titled Putin's Gamble, if you want to go back and listen to it. And also joining us, Ambassador William Taylor, now an expert on Russia and Europe at the U.S. Institute of Peace. He was the top U.S. diplomat in Ukraine during the presidency of Viktor Yuchenko. It was during that time when the U.S. promised Ukraine future NATO membership. He was also the chief diplomat in Kyiv in 2019. Anatole Levin, welcome back. Hello. And Ambassador Bill Taylor, we welcome you to the podcast. Thank you, Martin. It's good to be here. It's great to have you both. I'm excited to hear what each of you thinks about these issues. And let me just remind everyone who is listening, whether you're taking this episode in the day it's published or weeks afterward, we just had the Putin-Biden phone call. We now have both Russian and Ukrainian officials calling for more talks to possibly avert war. Maybe by having Ukraine disavow its desire to join NATO, according to one report. So as all of these developments unfold, I will start with you, Ambassador Taylor. What does Vladimir Putin want? I will explain why I'm starting with this question after I hear you answer it. But what is he seeking to obtain? The Donbass region, something more than that? So, Martin, I don't know Vladimir Putin. I imagine Anatole does, uh, and he probably has a better insight into Vladimir Putin's head than I do. But I will try to answer your question, since you asked me. I think he wants Ukraine. I think he wants more than Donbass. I think he wants more than, you know, Crimea. I think he wants more than a swath of territory from Donbass to uh, Odessa. I, I think he wants Ukraine. And his obsession with Ukraine is there for all to see. Anatole, I'm sure, has analyzed the 5,000-word historical analysis that President Putin published last summer. And what's clear from that is President Putin thinks that there is no Ukraine, that the Ukraine's not sovereign. Ukraine's actually part of Russia. And so he wants to reincorporate. He wants to reabsorb. He wants to dominate Ukraine. So I think that's what he's after, Martin. And again, I'm very interested to hear what Anatole says. Go ahead, Anatole. Well, firstly, one does have to repeat this. This isn't just Putin. I mean, this is the Russian establishment as a whole. But there is no intention of incorporating Ukraine in the sense of annexing the whole of Ukraine. The hope is, and by the way, the article didn't exactly speak of Ukrainians and Russians as one people, but as brotherly peoples. So the hope is to keep Ukraine as a friendly country to Russia and not a member of an alliance hostile to Russia, and also that within Ukraine, the Russian language will continue to play a major and recognized public role. So it is a, a desire to keep Ukraine within a form of Russian sphere of influence, at least a negative sphere of influence in the sense of excluding hostile alliances from Ukraine. Anatole, uh, the ambassador said he believes Putin wishes to dominate Ukraine. It sounds like you're saying something different. Well, a form of words. All I would say is, is that, of course, the, the Russians refer frequently to the Monroe Doctrine, which pretty much does say it, to, or part of it to an extent, which is that countries do not like hostile alliances on their on their borders. 
though in the Ukrainian case, as the ambassador has said, there is also the uh, the deep historical, cultural, linguistic factor as well. The Russians are very sensitive to the idea that the Russian language is, since the, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, ceasing to be an international language and is being replaced by English. That, once again, is hardly unusual. That has been a fear of France for very similar reasons ever since the end of the French Empire. The desire to, to exclude NATO and keep Ukraine as a country friendly to Russia. So, Ambassador Taylor, the reason why I ask the question is there is a heated debate happening now among Western intellectuals, journalists and former and current government officials about what Putin actually wants, whether he is using NATO expansion as a pretext to invade Ukraine, a nation whose sovereignty, as you mentioned, he has never respected. And Applebaum says people have been duped to argue, as Anatole does, that NATO expansion is a legitimate issue for Russia to be concerned about. What are your thoughts? Again, Martin, I think that President Putin wants to dominate, I'll say that again, Ukraine in one way or another. One way would be for him to invade. And he has indicated, <laughs> actually, he said, I don't intend to invade. Uh, you know, what's, what's all this about invasion? He said, I'm not intending to invade. But He says, if the NATO alliance and if the United States don't agree with these two treaties, draft treaties that he put down in the middle of December, if they don't, then I'll have to take what he calls military technical measures, which sounds a whole lot to the rest of the world like an invasion. And he has done more than just say so. He's put at least 130,000 Russians on three and a half borders of Ukraine to make that point. He can invade. He's got the capability of invading. And and there's no doubt that his military is able to do that. It's also clear, by the way, that the Ukrainian military will fight fiercely. They'll fight for their own land. They'll, They'll fight for their own territory, for their own sovereignty. And they will fight hard, but they're not a match for the Russian military. There's no doubt about that. So President Putin has this in mind. He wants to dominate. Now, That's one way he can do it. Another way he can do it is to somehow make this, the two little puppet states, LNR and DNR, the Luhansk People's Republic and the the Donbass, which make up the Donbass, or at least the occupied part of Donbass. If he can make those somehow autonomous, somehow give them inside Ukraine the ability to affect Ukrainian foreign policy, that might be a way of dominating Ukraine. And that would mean that those two little statelets would be able to deny, if Putin got his way on on what autonomy means, be able to deny Ukraine's membership application, at least, into NATO. So that's that's another way you can do it. And the EU as well. Anatole, go ahead. Look, first of all, could we please get away from this constant talk of Putin, Putin, Putin? Sure. Uh, ever since NATO expansion first came up in the 90s, Russian government, starting with that of Yeltsin, and including, by the way, very pro-Western Russian liberals, have been hostile to it. And above all, from the very beginning, and all of this is on the record, have warned that to take in Ukraine and Georgia, countries with territorial disputes with Russia, would ensure confrontation and risk war. This is not about Putin. Now, by the way, of course, many of the greatest American experts on Russia, including the greatest American diplomats working in Russia, Kennan, Pickering, Matlock, all said the same thing. They also warned against the idea of NATO membership. There is nothing in the slightest bit mysterious in geopolitical terms. And by the way, nothing in the slightest bit un-American about this hostility to NATO membership for Ukraine. It's totally comprehensible why the Russians should be taking this line. So this issue of what Boris Yeltsin may have promised about NATO expansion, Vladimir Putin brought this up in a news conference last year. Sorry, Anatole, I just mentioned his name again. But he brought up the not one inch promise apparently stated by James Baker in 1990, then the Secretary of State, promising the Soviets that NATO troops would not move east beyond the former East Germany after the Cold War. But back to Yeltsin, in May of 1997... He apparently paved the way, according to a New Yorker article for the alliance, NATO, to expand to include countries in Central and Eastern Europe and the Baltics. But then he disavowed this statement. Ambassador Taylor, as a professional diplomat, I don't know what to make, so I'm asking you, 
of all these agreements or documents that were signed, you know, 25, 30 years ago that may or may not be in effect anymore, being brought up again to make points on one side or the other. What do you make of all this from the 1990s? Is it still relevant? History, of course, is relevant. And history will show that there were a lot of conversations among a lot of people, both leading up to and during and after the fall of the Soviet Union in the 80s, early 90s. James Baker, Secretary of State, had some conversations before the fall of the Soviet Union. He uh, asked a couple of questions to see what the Soviet reaction would be of President Gorbachev. And then when he went back to Washington, Washington said, what were you thinking? President <laughs> Bush said Baker, that. Uh, or words to that effect. And you're right, Martin, there, were, there are signatures on documents from Gorbachev and Yeltsin in the 90s that indicate an acceptance of the expansion of NATO to countries who want to apply. The NATO itself was not going after these new, new members. These new members, once they were free in some real sense, after the Soviet Union disappeared, once they were free, they looked around and they said, you know, we're still threatened, not by the Soviet Union any longer, but we're threatened by the Russians. And we would like to have security from a defensive alliance. And I just want to emphasize that the defensive alliance, NATO has never been a threat to Russia. In fact, as some argue, NATO is the best insurance that the Russians could have against any kind of attack. NATO is a defensive alliance and several, as we know, several of the former Warsaw Pact and even several of the Soviet republics, the Baltics, looked around and said, we'd like to be as secure as NATO members. And so we applied. And the NATO alliance evaluated that and eventually said yes. I'm sorry, but we have to conduct this conversation at certain minimal levels of honesty and intellectual decency. Uh, to say simultaneously that countries wanted to be in NATO to defend themselves against Russia, and yet that NATO somehow was in Russia's own interest to defend it, is, to put it mildly, a little contradictory. In the case of the Baltic states, NATO acted as a cover for the disenfranchisement of a large part of the Russian population there. And the breaking of repeated promises to the Russian government before independence, in the presence of the West, by the way, that this would not happen. In the case of Ukraine and Georgia, NATO membership clearly, clearly implied the expulsion of the Russian Navy from its base at Sevastopol, more or less destroying the Russian strategic position in the Black Sea. And in the case of Georgia, it implied NATO taking the side of Georgia in the civil wars within Georgia against the rebellious ethnic minorities there. Now, obviously, this committed NATO to a deeply anti-Russian position. Not a physical attack on Russia, no, but undoubtedly a position that would be extremely hostile to Russia's legitimate geopolitical interests. Uh, I, I, I told you, yeah, I agree. We should have this on the basis of facts as we understand them. That's, that's, a, fair, that's a fair point, certainly. And I recall there was an attempt by NATO to engage with Russia in a NATO-Russia council. There were attempts to have this dialogue, to address issues, to deconflict concerns about military movements and these kinds of things. There, I'm not sure it was a hostile relationship from NATO. It, it was certainly defensive. You know, NATO did want to and makes every effort to defend its members against potential threats. And you're right, during the 90s and in the early 2000s, Russia did not pose a threat, an obvious threat to NATO members. And NATO drew down dramatically. It was only after 2014, when the threat from Russia was clear. By that, I mean the actions of uh, Russia by invading a sovereign nation, a sovereign neighbor, first in Crimea and then in Donbass, that suggested to the world, and in particular to NATO members, that the Russians didn't respect sovereignty and didn't recognize the rights to be, to exist. And so that did trigger, that indeed did trigger a, a lot of worry about Russia, and it triggered a lot of action to take measures to defend NATO allies from a newly threatening Russia. Please, can we be serious here? There is absolutely no Russian threat to Poland, or indeed there has never been a single statement 
of military threat to Poland or any other existing member of NATO. Even in the case of the Baltic states, there have been Russian complaints, but no threat of invasion. What is happening now is about Ukraine. Secondly, to say that NATO hostility to Russia began in 2014, if you look at the facts of what happened in Georgia, in 2008, with the encouragement of the United States, although the United States then backed away from it again. It is simply impossible to argue that NATO hostility to to Russia began in 2014. And the West unconditionally took the side of Georgia in that conflict, although as has subsequently been revealed by the West's own observers on the ground, it was Georgia that started that war. And Georgia only started that war because of an admittedly mistaken impression that America would come to its aid and defend it against a Russian counterattack. So let us, for heaven's sake, not pretend that NATO in its hostility to Russia is simply a reactive organization. It isn't. As far as the NATO-Russia Council is concerned, you know perfectly well what happened. On every occasion, the NATO members would get together in advance, form a common position, and then present it to Russia as a fait accompli. Even when There were cases where leading European members of NATO profoundly disagreed with US policy towards Russia. For example, withdrawal from the ABM Treaty. There was no occasion, no occasion on which at the NATO-Russia Council, they were willing to side with Russia against the United States. So the idea that this is some kind of dialogue, I'm sorry, (laughs) please, this, this is like saying to the Russians that NATO is somehow in their interest and going to defend them. Uh, It's an insult to their intelligence and has contributed enormously to the deterioration of relations. Ambassador, anything to uh, respond to there? No, it's not surprising to me that the NATO allies had a, a common view and that the Russians opposed that view in these discussions. But I didn't mean, I didn't say, and certainly don't believe that NATO is there to defend Russia. No. Although there was talk, Anatole, you'll recall some of this, there was um, some indication early on uh, that there was some interest on the part of a couple of Russian leaders, maybe even including President Putin, to uh, maybe, maybe join NATO. There, that was that, right. there was that there. There was some talk in the early post-Cold War years about Russia joining NATO, but it obviously did not go anywhere. I do want to move on to what the Ukrainians are thinking in this conflict. It seems they are often overlooked in the way this conflict is framed between the U.S. and Russia or the West and Russia, democracy versus authoritarianism. You know Vladimir Zelensky quite well. You sat down with him many occasions, including recently. What is going on there with him? His voice seems to get overshadowed in all of this. Martin, you're right. The Ukrainians are sovereign, and they're proud of that sovereignty. They have a distinct history. They have a distinct culture. They have a distinct language. Uh, They have their own heroes. They're very proud of the Slavic Christian culture that started in Kievan Rus. They're very proud of St. Sophia's, uh, right in the center of Kiev, that was completed in the 11th century. In the 11th century, we recall, and Anatol knows this history much better than I, But 11th century, there was no mention of Moscow. Moscow was a forest. And so Kievan Rus is the origin of of these peoples. So it answers your question, Martin. They want to maintain that sovereignty. They've been sovereign for 30 years. They feel that sovereignty is being challenged, not just militarily on their borders, but by by Mr. Putin, and I will go back to Mr. Putin. I understand, Anatole, that he uh, that there are others who believe like he does, but but he's a pretty important decision maker. And Mr. Putin has indicated that he doesn't see Ukraine as a sovereign nation. So I have to say, President Zelensky, and I did meet with him two weeks ago today, um, we had a very good conversation, and he struck me then as being determined, as being calm, of being resolute in the face of this challenge. And he is staring down President Putin, who has got 130,000 troops on his border. But Zelensky has also criticized the United States and the West publicly, saying they're causing a near panic by day after day, saying a Russian invasion is imminent. So there are two messages that need to go to the world and to the Ukrainian people and to the Russians. One message is calm determination. And that's what President Zelensky is projecting. The other message is there are 130,000 Russians on the border of Ukraine poised to invade. And we need to, we, the United States and NATO and the West, needs to do things to 
deter that invasion. And to deter that invasion, we have to make it clear what we see. And the intelligence is very clear. The intelligence is not even intelligence. I mean, it's on the front pages of all newspapers. Then you look on TV show, you, you see overhead projections of all this force. To deter that, Martin, you need to do two things. You tell President Putin and others, I take it, Anatole, uh, but tell President Putin that if he invades, if he chooses invasion rather than negotiation, which are his two choices, then the invasion decision will lead to very bad outcomes for Russia economically. I even think, and I'd be very interested in Anatole's thoughts on this, I think that the Russian people will not support a Russian attack, invasion of Ukraine. My bet is, but again, Anatole will know this much better than I, my bet is a war, a Russian war against Ukraine would not be popular. And who knows? Some people have said, including senior retired generals recently, have said that this could destabilize Putin's regime. I'd be very interested in Anatole's thoughts on all this. But first, could I ask, perhaps a little ironically, if the West has signaled calm determination by evacuating our diplomats from Kiev and encouraging our citizens to flee? Like I say, there are two messages. One is a calm determination, which President Zelensky and, and President Biden have shown. But the second is to take prudent measures to keep people out of harm's way if there's going to be an aerial bombardment of Kiev, for example, which is, which is a real concern. Forgive me, but I mean, this makes Western commitment to Ukraine an absurdity, simply an absurdity. How can Ukrainians possibly trust our commitment or friendship after this? I mean, really? I mean, look, for that matter, you could well say, I mean, at that rate, why are the Russians scared of NATO? As to your question about the Russian people, we don't know, to be honest. The test of war often reveals uh, surprising things. We don't know whether Russian public support will hold up. We don't know, God forbid, in the event of war, we don't know how hard the Ukrainian army will fight. And we also don't know how the population in Russian-speaking areas of the country will react. Because I have to remind the ambassador, there are multiple identities in Ukraine. I entirely agree. The great majority of the Ukrainian people are now dedicated to Ukrainian independence. But they have different ideas of the Ukrainian national identity and cultural identity. And of course, especially in recent months, for you know reasons I can understand, but still, there have been some pretty severe measures coming from the Ukrainian government and parliament to reduce the role of the Russian language in Ukraine, which appears to be, for understandable reasons, pretty unpopular in Russian-speaking areas of the country. So the answer is, I don't know. I do not know how things would go in the event of war. I very much hope that a war and a Russian invasion will not happen. I have to say I sympathise entirely with the Ukrainian government on that. I do not think that we are helping Ukraine by this rather hysterical talk of imminent Russian invasion, and least of all by moves to withdraw our diplomats from Kiev, when indeed we should be using calm determination, but with the emphasis as much on calm as on the determination. I should just shut my microphone off and let you two continue. But I do want to I do want to ask a question, Anatole, to you first. I, I mentioned earlier James Baker's Not One More Inch promise, and we also referenced Boris Yeltsin and what he may have agreed to about NATO's future in the mid-1990s. But Vladimir Putin, if we go by his public statements, seems to believe that those promises should have been kept. So, to finally get to my question, Anatole, why do you believe some people in the West are unwilling to concede the fact that Russia might have legitimate security concerns here? Well, because in the end, to admit legitimate Russian security concerns in its neighborhood would contradict what has been the standard operating procedure of American administrations since the mid-1990s, which is based on the Wolfowitz Doctrine, that America has universal global primacy, and America and only America decides what influence countries have beyond their own borders. Obviously, Russia's influence in what the Russians call its near abroad is a challenge to that, which, you know, if you believe in universal American primacy, cannot possibly be accepted. As to the notion of the rules-based order, and universal respect for sovereignty and non-interference. I mean, please, given America's record, 
over the past generation and indeed beyond. Can one possibly say this with a straight face, that this has been America's own approach to the world? Of course not, but that does not allow Mr. Putin to do as he pleases, but I get your point. So, Martin, if I could respond to your question in a different way, and that is to say that right now there is on the table a willingness to address Russian security concerns very directly. Some of the demands that Russia put in these draft document, draft treaties for NATO and for the United States have some legitimate concerns in there. And of course, NATO has some legitimate concerns as well. And so that's the basis for a serious negotiation or maybe several serious negotiations between, in the first instance, Russia and the United States on strategic stability. And we're talking about intermediate range nuclear forces, INF. And there used to be, as we all know, there used to be a an INF treaty, and Anatole and I will probably disagree about why it's no longer there. We say it's because the Russians violated, the Russians say we pulled out, whatever. But, but there used to be one, and there could be again. There could be an agreement, a treaty. It could have the force of law, as President Putin says he wants it to be, that would regulate and maybe even ban, but certainly regulate intermediate nuclear forces in Europe, both on the NATO side and on the Russia side. And including in Ukraine, which is one of the concerns that the Russians have expressed about these weapons. They're worried that some some nuclear weapons or INF weapons would go into Ukraine. Okay, we can talk about that's a perfectly legitimate concern. NATO and the United States are willing to address. Similarly, um, the Russians have expressed concern about B-52 bombers or other nuclear capable warships or aircraft that fly too close to Russian borders. Fair point. We would be happy to have a negotiation, and maybe this is a broader negotiation that would include more nations who would be affected by this treaty. Again, we used to have a treaty along these lines. It's called the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, CFE. That could be the basis for some confidence building, some transparency, some notification of of exercises that would give people confidence that neither side was about to invade the other. There are other areas as well, but there's a perfectly legitimate concerns on both sides that could be negotiated. And it sounds like, Martin, just today, it sounds like there's movement in that direction. So, Ambassador, there are deeper issues here, though, about the American role in the world, to use Anatole's turn of phrase, American primacy, which is becoming increasingly hollow because of U.S. conduct post-Cold War. I understand that This situation is horrible for Ukrainians. No one wants to see a war. We all agree that Vladimir Putin cannot act like a mid-1930s strongman and revise international boundaries. But at the same time, I can't see the fate of the Donbass region as a U.S., vital U.S. national security interest. So, Martin, I would say if we want to return to an order, which I take Anatole's point that the United States has not been totally abiding by. I, I let, Let's be clear. I mean, I, I'm willing to admit that there are examples yeah, the, where we didn't. The history but, of but the CIA would uh, speak to that, but go ahead. If, if we want to return to some kind of rules-based order, I, I imagine the Russians would like that too, based on what we just said about previous violations. If we want to return to that, then we have to respect sovereignty. And I take your point, you know, haven't always done that. If we want to return to something that kept the peace, let's, let's be clear, since 1945 until 2014, There were no major land wars in Europe, and it's because there were these understandings, principles, agreements, treaties that regulated conduct among states. And to return to that, to try to get to that, it would be important, even critical, that, as you just said, Martin, that nations that violate other nations' borders turn them back over, retreat back into, into their own borders. So that would be my first. There's another more moral one, which is Ukraine is kind of on the is on the front line. And we need to support Ukraine on on that front line. I know Anatole's going to jump all over that. Ukraine is on the front line because NATO pushed to the east. But I'll let Anatole speak for himself. Well, first of all, I should say that I I completely support the idea of negotiations on the CFE, on intermediate nuclear weapons. But uh, look, the only reason why we are willing to talk about this now, having been unwilling to talk about it for many years, is because Putin assembled an army on Ukraine's borders. If he hadn't, we wouldn't be talking. No, that's Uh, not true. That's actually not true, Anatole. Sorry to interrupt, but that's not true. We've been talking about INF 
for some time, ever since start two. So this is an ongoing process. Yeah, go ahead, Anatole. But the only reason we are prepared possibly to give a bit more. Anyway, but uh, as to the wider point, peace in Europe during the Cold War was secured by the nuclear balance of terror, a huge American army, but also, of course, because since the late 40s and Eisenhower's solarium exercise, it was decided on both sides that they would not try to expand with the backing of military force or subversion beyond the borders laid down. That is why the United States did not intervene in Hungary or Czechoslovakia. The peace in Europe was due to something quite different. As far as the wider issue of uh, borders uh, is concerned, look, in principle, I entirely agree. And I also believe, you know, ideally in a world based on the rule of law. But let us also recognize the fact that the end of empires has always led to numerous territorial disputes in which some of our own allies, and I'm thinking above all of Turkey in Cyprus, have of course done exactly the same thing as Russia without our doing anything about it whatsoever. Nothing. Um, so we have to operate in a world in which somehow we have got to reconcile our concern for legality with respect for the realities of power and national interest. Now, in fact, that is how American policy is made when it comes to America and American allies. The point is that we also need to respect that if we are to maintain a measure of peaceful consensus in the world, we also have to have this approach to American rivals as well. Last question as we talk here in mid-February. Ambassador Taylor, do you think the Russians are going to invade? Martin, I'm on the record of saying 55-45 against an invasion. And that's because, again, not knowing President Putin or the other people who helped make that decision, Anatole, I am impressed with the costs that would be imposed on Russia if if they were to invade. So I'm 55-45 against an invasion. Hope you're right. Anatole, go ahead. Yep, I'd be a little stronger than that. I'd say six to four against uh, an invasion, but certainly, yep, I'd agree. It is a possibility. And what a tragedy that would be. Anatole Levin and Ambassador Bill Taylor, we thank you for this exchange of ideas. On the next episode of History As It Happens, we're going to get to the subject we were supposed to talk about today before events in Eastern Europe intervened, and that is the war in Yemen and U.S. complicity in a humanitarian catastrophe. That's next when we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. 